Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Madam Chairpersons. I'm very grateful uh, for those very kind words of uh, introduction, and also very grateful to the President and the Council of the SLMA and the uh, Academic Committee and the Chairpersons especially uh, for allowing me this privilege of making this presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in all humility, I stand here before you very conscious of the fact that I'm the only barrier now between you and your lunch. So I will try and make it uh, short and perhaps uh, uh, less painful as I could possibly make it. Uh, research leading to a publication is my topic. At the outset, let me make a declaration. Some of these slides were very kindly provided by Dr. Anrud Dabayugna Sekhar, Edith Emeritus of the Sloan Medical Journal. I start off with a little anecdotal story. This is our iconic foreign minister of yore, Mr. Lakshman Kadirgam. And in 2005, almost 50 years after he left Oxford, Lakshman Kadirgama's portrait was unveiled at the Oxford Union. This was a great honor bestowed by the Oxford Union on only 15 others in its 183 year history. And at that event, Mr. Kadirgama was kind enough to say that Oxford was the icing on the cake, but the cake was baked at home. Well, this cake was also very definitely baked here, and the icing was not only from England, but also from Sri Lanka. Part of that icing was a quarter of a century of work as a medical editor. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will try my best to bring you some of my experience, which I have gained over these 25 years as a medical editor. Now we have heard and we know very well that research publications have always been an important key to building a successful career in medicine. And this is particularly so in the academic environments, especially in the academic institutions like the universities. Now, once again, that these are judged on their publications. And really, if you like to talk of it as a barrier, it's the editors of journals who play a crucial role in the publication processes, who stand between you, your research, and the publication. Editorial responsibilities need to be looked at. And here is a list of all the responsibilities that are there for an editor. From in ensuring integrity of the published public academic record, to investigating possible or proven misconduct. But what is most important is that these people, editors, are accountable. They are responsible essentially for what appears in a journal and published in the public academic record. And therefore, many editors believe that they need to be given complete independence and powers to make editorial decisions on manuscripts. Before we go on to what editors really uh, need and what they like to see, what kind of people are they? Very often, they are renowned researchers in their own right, well qualified in a given discipline, especially if it is a specialist journal. They are generally quite reasonable people and fair by and large. They are very often a moderating influence you will find that even the decisions made by reviewers and even the editorial boards are sometimes um, uh, changed by the, the experience uh, and the knowledge of the editors. They will generally safeguard the journal. <clears throat> Majority are not autocratic and allow unto themselves quite contrary to popular belief. Almost always they have volunteered for punishment really. Uh, but they invariably love the job, and that's why they are doing this, because it's uh, a volunteer job. 
Now, there are very many types of articles that editors have to deal with, which include a whole load of things that I have listed here, going down from editorials down to letters and correspondence. But out of these, I think as far as much of the audience for this presentation is concerned, that the most important are the research papers and the original articles. Now, a question is there, are journal editors and authors aligned? Do they understand each other? Now, if you ask this question from many of the authors, they would unhesitatingly say, no, they don't understand. The editors, they are not aligned with us, with the authors. But if you ask the same question uh, from the editors, very often the answer is yes, actually. The editors really know, they are well aware of the challenges faced by authors. And if you ask the question, do authors know exactly what journal editors want? Editors would very often say no. And that is really the, perhaps the reason why this topic was selected uh, as the final presentation today. So what do editors really want? So the rest of it is going to be all about what we editors like to see in, the, in our submissions, in the submissions to our journals. The editors really like a good story. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess in a wonderful kingdom. One day she met a handsome young prince from the adjoining kingdom. They fell in love and got married. They produced six lovely children. All of them lived happily ever after. The fairy stories that we have heard so much before. Now, this contention on my part is not original. Actually, I owe it to this man, Professor Janaka De Silva, who proclaimed this a couple of decades ago at one of his presentations. But his proclamation stopped there. The rest of it that I'm going to talk about, this good story, is all entirely mine. I'll come back to that story again later, but the main components of the research paper that is submitted should be a title, which should be brief but descriptive, catchy but not outraged. Well, if you want to say that uh, as the title of your paper, efficacy of a novel COVID vaccine, that's fine by the editors. But if you go to the extent of saying a novel COVID vaccine, God's own gift to mankind, that will not carry any weight. No editor will print that. Then you have to write an abstract, which is structured into an introduction, objectives, method, results, conclusions. And remember, there is a word limit in all journals for the abstract. Do not go above that. Try and do it even a few words below that. <clears throat> Then there are keywords. You have to select these very carefully so that somebody who looks at this topic later on in, in, in any kind of uh, index uh, will come across your, your work. And it will be nice to put in Sri Lanka somewhere there as well so that the country gets a little bit of an exposure as well. So we the editors like this word, two words Sri Lanka to come in as well. Then, of course, there is the main body, which is organized or structured into introduction, objectives, method, results, discussion, and conclusions. It's very well known to all of you. Then references should be listed in a designated style. Could be Vancouver or Harvard. There are so many different uh, ways in which references could be presented. So uh, you have to decide on the way it should be presented depending on the journal. Then figures and tables have to be provided. The caption for a figure appears or an image appears below the graphic and the caption for a table should be above the table. Now, it's um, easy to get these wrong, but the way to remember is very simple. Remember table top. So all tables will have the caption at the top, everything else at the bottom and the acknowledgements. And do not forget to acknowledge the people who have helped you so much in your research and the writing up 
of the manuscript. The main body of the paper really basically, the content should be organized like a good story. I come back to my story with a beginning, a middle and the ending. And of course, it should confirm to the author guidelines of the journal. So organizing the content in the beginning, why did you start and what did you want to do? And these will be included in your introduction or a background or the, and the objectives. In the middle, what did you do? That's in the method. What did you find in the results section? How do you interpret it is in the discussion. And in the end, what does it mean? The conclusions. And this should be based on objectives and results. No fancy statements. And very often we see these further studies are necessary. This is not really needed to be said in the conclusion. This is obvious that every topic needs more and more studies to be done. So this is the accepted, internationally accepted IMRAD format where it's introduction, method, results, and discussion. But I would like to slightly add now because add one more because some journals want this. It's EOMRAD, which is introduction and objectives added to that method, results, and discussion. I come back to my fairy story. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess type of thing. And here is how this matches in with your manuscript. So you have a beginning, you have a middle, and you need an end. And here is how you can easily match that. The introduction, objectives and method, results, discussion and conclusion uh, as uh, a status where all of them live happily ever after. Now, what do editors really want? I've given you the very basics of how it should be written. Now, what do we editors really look for? There are some major criteria. Newness, novelty, and uniqueness. Now, if your work is something entirely new, novel, and is unique, well, there you are. You stand a very good chance. Trueness, obviously, you have to be true to yourself and the study. Then proper usage of the scientific method. You have heard you have heard from all the presenters before me today about the scientific method all of that was uh, uh, proper usage of the scientific method you heard all about it uh, the scientific method how to do it and this is crucial if your manuscript does not fit into the basics of a proper scientific method it will not be successful. I can guarantee that. So you can't make fundamental errors in your scientific method of the research that you have carried out. And the importance, obviously, that we look for the importance of the work that has been done. And precision and clarity of writing, I'll come to that in a moment. And whether there is a take home message, it, it should be nice if there is a take home message. Uh, from your research work. And there are other criteria, the appropriateness for the readership to fit in with the aims and scope of the journal, really, basically. And these are all available in the websites of these journals. And avoidance of misconduct and plagiarism. And the writing style, flawless, simple language. Once again, I'll be coming to that in a moment. Brevity conciseness, that is, be short in all your statements. And adherence to the journal's author guidelines, obviously. And appropriateness for the journal. Now, general journals would prefer articles for the general generalist, but can include specialist articles as well. Example is the Ceylon Medical Journal. Then you have specialist journals would confine itself to articles on a broad subject area, like our own Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health. Then there are ultra specialist journals, which would confine their articles to a highly restricted area, like the official journal of the Pediatric Cardiology Association of India, that is the Annals of Pediatric Cardiology. It's about children and only the cardiac problems in children. 
Plagiarism. All medical editors have zero tolerance for plagiarism. And if you want a description, here is the description of plagiarism uh, from the World Association of Medical Editors. The use of others published and unpublished ideas or words or other intellectual property without attribution or permission and presenting them as new and original rather than derived from an existing source. In light of and ladies and gentlemen, that's why in my very first slide about the fairy story that uh, I inserted the photograph of Professor Janakadi Silva to say that it was originally not mine, but it was his. Otherwise I would have been um, uh, accused of plagiarism as well. Plagiarism is really a major problem. Uh, and you have plagiarism of ideas that may have been taken, plagiarism of text, which is called direct plagiarism, then mosaic plagiarism, where someone has taken uh, 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 some idea or uh, 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 work that have been done, which is almost similar to the original source, but you have changed some words and made it look as if it's your own work. So that is mosaic plagiarism. And of course, last uh, is the self-plagiarism, which I have my own uh, arguments about, because I believe that there is no such thing as self-plagiarism, because if you have done some work, you should be entitled to be able to quote your own work. The style of writing, this is very important. The classical style of scientific writing is a triad, uh, three things, very simple. Use simple language. And very important, you have to decide whether you're going to write it in English USA or English UK. And that entirely depends on the journal. And remember that all computers, the default language is English USA. So if you are going to write to an English journal or even Sri Lankan journals, most of them would prefer the Queen's language, English UK. Then secondly, be as brief as possible and avoid unnecessary verbosity. Brevity and clarity. <clears throat> shortest possible text. Cut down on superfluous words. Be concise and use short sentences. Very important, short sentences. Use simple words. Editors and readers really should not need a dictionary to understand your article. And avoid typographical errors. And you have to read it over and over again. And very often, this terminology of typographical errors are a very kind and diplomatic way of calling something rubbish or poor English. And remember that if you're going into a career of research and uh, writing loads of papers, that reading makes writing very easy. If you are an avid reader, you'll find it much easier to write. Short and simple sentences, I said this before, about 20 or less number of words for a sentence. And if a sentence is too long, break it into two or three or even five sentences. Here's an example. A 35 year old man, a farmer presented with fever and jaundice, which he noted, it goes on and on and on. This is, mind you, one uh, sentence of 54 words. It's really a paragraph. All that you need to say really, if you want to change this uh, to a definite scientific format is that a 35 year old farmer had fever and jaundice one month ago, 12 words of one sentence of 12 words. At that time he had gallstones without bile duct obstruction and normally you function a second sentence of 16 words, which gives you all the information that was given in that entire paragraph. Then you have a thing called the end fixation, this is my own uh, uh, thing that I have decided on, what is called the end fixation. Now here's an example. The cohort consisted of children and they were all under 18 years of age and their parents were under the poverty line and there was overcrowding at home and only 30% of them were schooling and their daily form of school transport was by state-owned buses and it was found that, the, again, uh, a whole sentence of 83 words, but here, what is important and why I call it and fixation, is that look at the number of times the word and has been used. There are 83 words and in that, 
and the word and is repeated nine times. Then make it uh, uh, an abiding principle to use simple words. Now things like approximately in order to possess, prior to demonstrate, ameliorate. There are much simpler words such as these about to have before show improve to use in a scientific article. And avoid word padding. A considerable proportion of subjects in the cohort of patients reported here in this study developed visible hematuria when their urine samples were examined. Now you can detect hematuria only when you examine urine samples. You don't have to go to all that extent to say that. So, see the way it can be shortened. Many patients developed hematuria, full stop. All that padding can be removed. It is plainly and clearly demonstrable from the observed study data of the subjects that are presented in table two. All that you are trying to say is table two shows. As simple as that. <clears throat> and avoid unnecessary verbosity. These, uh, the third principle of the triad that I earlier said. In this relevant and specific context, as a matter of fact, it has to be mentioned that it can be said clearly and unequivocally that, you know, expressions like that, which are rather nice in any other form of uh, writing, but not in a scientific article. And avoid superfluous words. It has been clearly and conclusively noted from an extensive survey of the printed and electronic literature that during the protracted period of time that the anuria lasts, the level of platelets are very often elevated in excess of the normal range in a vast majority of patients. 48 words. All that you are trying to say is studies have shown that in the majority, while anuria lasts, the platelet count is abnormally raised. Just 16 words. And avoid long words. Pneumono, ultra microscopic, silico, volcano, coniosis. In fact, these are definite words, actually. It's the longest word in the English language with 44 letters of the alphabet in it. Now, it refers to pneumoconiosis caused by the inhalation of silica dust or quartz dust. And the substitute word is a lot simpler, silicosis, nine letters. Of course, if you have to talk about something like pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, 30 letters of the alphabet, you have no alternative for this. You have to keep on saying pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. And there are some ridiculous statements that you sometimes find in scientific uh, submissions. The patient noticed that his feces had an offensive smell. Now, I don't know whether there is anybody who actually passes um, rose-smelling feces. It was meant to be more offensive, perhaps, that one word would have changed the entire outlook. Depressed individuals may fail to decrease sadness. <laughs> I don't know what Chaturi would say about this, but um, well, this doesn't really make sense to an editor. Might make sense to a psychiatrist, but uh, not to an editor, I think. They're lesser mortals. Um, live specimens of the larvae were found in the feces as well as in the fruits. Now, for some reason, you don't want to really talk about these two fruits and feces together. Scientists noted, noted that there were differences between the sexes. Of course, there are differences between the sexes. That's what makes the world go around. There were three kinds of subjects in the study. One group who were athletic and the other non-athletic. Full stop. Now, where the third group? If you talk about two groups out of three, you have to talk about the third group as well. It's a fundamental error in expression. The patients were not afraid of being scared. 
and this is the one I really like best. Some subjects did not eat lobsters because the lobsters were alive when they were killed. You can't kill a dead lobster. So it doesn't make sense. So they are all examples of ridiculous statements. They are from real life, actually. And the tense of your expressions, research paper should always be written in the past tense as the work has already been done. Unlike a project proposal, a project proposal in the, is in the future tense. So that if you're going to say something about jaundice, you say all patients had jaundice or all were jaundiced. Methodology, this word. The definition of methodology is the analysis of the principles of methods, rules, and postulates employed by discipline, the study of methods. Now, you may have noticed that almost all the presenters before me today use this word methodology, but with great justification, because they were talking about analysis of a method. They were talking about analysis of a method. But when you write it in a scientific manuscript of what you have done, you're not talking about a complete analysis of the method. And the method, the definition, is a procedure or a process for obtaining an object, such as a systemic procedure or a technique, a mode of inquiry. And that's exactly what you do in research. And it's better to call it materials and methods or methods as seen in two of the most reputed journals, British Medical Journal and the New England Journal of Medicine. They never use the word methodology. And we don't use it in our, our humble journals as well. Now, citing the references in the main text. This is quite important in your manuscript. And also, very often, the journals in the author guidelines will give you guidance about this. See the way, now, those highlighted ones in yellow, the way it has been um, uh, expressed in many manuscripts. Now, I think the best out of this is the one that I have highlighted the, the, in black as well. That is a uh, uh, superscript of the reference in parentheses or in brackets. Now see what happens when you don't get it right. Now see these highlighted uh, numbers of the references. Now this can be mistaken for item number 14 and item number 15 rather than a reference because they are in the same script as the rest of your uh, manuscript. And the reference list though, by a bi a bibliography. Now many people write reference number five, Fernando XYZ, uh, the reference is given, Sri Lanka General Child Health, 2021, March 25th, and um, volume five, issue one, pages 10 to 12. This is the Vancouver way of expressing this. But here, it's obvious somebody has copied this from somewhere and pasted it because the Journal of Child Health, 2021, Volume five, issue one is always in March and you don't have to put that March 25. Right? You just cut that off, you make it short as well. And it, the editor, that this person has not really looked at this, um, this reference, just copied and pasted it perhaps. The bottom line is that academic scientific writing should be precise, accurate, concise, and presented in simple, grammatically correct language. Scientific writing is really an art and a proper formulation of the content, just like a painting is vital. And uh, the three important things are keep things simple. And before you submit an article to a journal, it's always uh, necessary and quite good to read the author guidelines of the journal. Then also read a few articles in that journal before submitting it to that journal so that you get an idea of the style of the journal because different journals have different styles. And adhere to these instructions and stick to the style.
if you want to get your paper published in that journal at least. There are some finer points expected by the editors like compliance with other guidelines written in proper language. And of course, if you are submitting it to a US journal or which uses US English, you have to make sure that you go back to your default language in your computer. And compatibility with the declared policies of the journal, ethical clearance or exemption, as you have already heard, and clinical trials registration. And our journal will not even uh, review an article of a clinical trial where they have not specifically mentioned about clinical trials registration and given the number of the, uh, of the certificate of uh, clinical trials registration. Method and results clearly presented, this is vital. <laughs> These are the two things, two primary things that on which the, your manuscript will be judged to a great extent. And then, of course, the third thing that it will judge on will be the discussion, which should be fruitful based on the results and include comparisons with available data from elsewhere. That's exactly the reason why you have a discussion. Really not to say that, uh, you know, we found this and we found that and things like that. And then the conclusions should be based on objectives and the results. And statements like it was so very nice to conduct this study uh, type of thing is totally irrelevant. That's not a conclusion uh, from a scientific context. The references, all relevant references, tile as per the guidelines of the journal. And there are certain special considerations, so like validation of tools that you have used, which we would look for. And certainly if a study is, was done, which is sent to your journal as something that had been done for the first time in the world, of course, the editor will, uh, you know, have his ears flapping on that. But first time in Sri Lanka, well, it may be a study type of uh, scientific uh, information available all over the world, hundreds and thousands of times more. Although you had done it for the first time in Sri Lanka, it really has not much value. Then situations where there is very little data in the world and also from Sri Lanka, perhaps it might be considered. And of course, not engage in any research misconduct or plagiarism. <laughs> now, why do editors want all this? Uh, go on to the extent of saying, this is what we want. Now, here the reason. Are they stupid? Do they have a poor command of the English language that they want to keep it simple? I think it's a fair assumption to say that they are fairly intelligent. And they're either very good or excellent command of the English. The reasons are that they have to cater to their readers, keep things simple. They're involved in conserving journal space as much as possible. And they have to have consistency of the published articles over all the issues of the journal and maintain the required standards of expression in scientific articles. Editors are generally people who want to help the researchers, quite contrary to popular misconceptions. But they have certain responsibilities to the journal, to the authors and readers, and science in general, and of course the society as a whole, because they're responsible for the published public record. And very few are abrasive and ill-mannered. Editors routinely get brickbats and accolades. Brickbats much, much more frequently than the accolades. This is uh, an image of two people, two elderly people, one and two. But actually, if you look carefully, there is a third and a fourth and a fifth as well. So what editors do is to look very carefully at the submissions. If something looks a bit fishy in a submission, we take it very seriously. And this is something my guru taught me, late Dr. Stella Gertrude de Selva, with whom I had the privilege to work as her co uh, joint editor, who was the editor emeritus of Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health. 
which uh, both of us uh, converted it to the quarterly journal in the year 2000, she said, if something looks a bit fishy in a journal article, it invariably would turn out to be quite fishy. And she's dead right. <clears throat> and we have seen it over and over again. Here's one example. A recent submission to the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health had 91% plagiarism on a 10 word filter. Because I, I, they come to me and they have these uh, submissions are sent to me directly uh, through the electronic portal. And I run them first through these plagiarism checking software of Crossref. And I did that similarity check and sent it to the other joint editor because my joint, the other joint editor takes over from there. He found that 62% was plagiarized from just one other article. That article had identical authors and the content was the same. So this submission was for a duplicate publication. So we took the appropriate steps after that. Paper mills. How many of you have heard of them? Madam Chairpersons, have you all heard of this paper mills? The English uh, language dictionary uh, defines it, defines paper mills as uh, refers to factories devoted to making paper from vegetable fibers such as Um, so I think this is where we stopped or uh, the computer played up. Uh, and uh, I was talking on, I think, paper mills. Um, now that's the English definition. In the academic scenario, paper mills are those that churn out false research papers and essays on demand to suit the requests of those who make use of them to secure publications. These are huge huge problem at the moment. And it's also a huge, huge business. The company that uh, deals with these, the companies actually are in one country, there are ghost writers in another country and the customers are in another country. These ghost writers, their names don't come into it at all. And it's done for considerable sums of money and one ghost writer uh, claimed to have earned US dollars 66,000 per annum by writing these completely fraudulent productions. So they will even uh, falsify entire sets of data to write the paper that the customer wants. Now here is a letter that I would like to write a rejection letter. Quite contrary to what I have said so far about writing a scientific article, this is full of flowery language, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going against all that I have said before, but with a purpose. I've said, thank you ever so much for the above listed submission to our journal. It is with much regret that I have to inform you that following careful review of the paper, it has been decided that it would be possible it would not be possible to accept the paper for publication in the journal. The reviewers are blinded during the review process and their comments and suggestions are attached. We hope very much that these will be useful to you. We hope that you will be able to secure publication of your work depicted in this paper in another suitable journal. We also do hope that you will consider our journal for future submissions of your work to do. So lots of flowery language to soften the blow really, because nobody likes um, any submission uh, to be rejected. This was actually, the paper was absolute rubbish, but I would never dream of calling it that to the author. The reason is uh, quite selfish really. The reason is that this time, this author may have submitted some rubbish. And if I called it that, that author will never ever submit another article to our journal. Whereas his next research project might be groundbreaking in nature, which I would want to publish in our journal. So that's the reason for all that flowery language. So I hope that justifies it. How many of you want to do a perfect research project and write the perfect research paper? I'm sure if I ask you to put up your hand, even including the two 
Madam Chairpersons, I think they will put up their hands. They'll want to do the perfect project and write the perfect research paper. I'm sorry to disappoint you. These do not exist. Editors are well aware of it. You can never, ever do a perfect job in this uh, research endeavors so that there are limitations. And this is the uh, uh, verbatim uh, reproduction from one of the submissions, which wrote down the limitations very, very nicely. The study results should, should be interpreted with the following limitations. A qualitative study was carried out and all the reasons are given. So before we even ask that person about limitations, that author or a set of authors really for that matter had actually put it down. This will go down very well with an editor, right? Admitting your own, the limitations in your own submission. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, what do editors really want? So very concisely, a good new and original story with a beginning, a middle and an ending, as brief as possible because editors do not like and people also do not read long articles. And it should be written in simple language with adherence to journals, instructions to authors and with a reasonable take home message. You want your submission to stand out head and shoulders above the others. That is what you want. When an editor sees an article that stands out, uh, the editor will be inclined to try and do his or her best to publish it. So ladies and gentlemen, with the national fly in hand, it is my pleasure and privilege now to wish you good luck with all your submissions. We hope you get hundreds and thousands of publications hopefully as a result of all that few things, all the few things that I have said in my presentation. I wouldn't blame you, ladies and gentlemen, if some of you had fallen asleep, especially during the period where the Murphy's Law was operating on the computer. But I hope my mouth has managed to keep your interest. And for those of you who are still the hardcore who has stuck with me all this time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much for that excellent presentation, sir. And this says your presentation is better than lunch. <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you very much, sir. And ending our session today.